when a leader or a team member actually expresses awkward discomfort in the moment that they feel it, there are so many benefits. It actually makes people come across as more trustworthy, more kind, more generous, and more forgivable, and actually helps people increase relationship satisfaction with that person. So people hear this and they're like, how? Why? Because your lack of perfection puts other people at ease. Helping you create loyal customers and loyal employees all through the power of simplicity. This is the Simple Brand Podcast, now heard around the world, including Avon, Connecticut. I'm your host, Matt Lyles, and this week I'm talking with one of my good friends, Henna Pryor. Henna is a highly sought after workplace performance expert. She's a global keynote speaker and a two times TEDx speaker. She's been featured in Forbes, Real Simple, Fast Company, and more. And Henna's the author of Good Awkward How to Embrace the Embarrassing and Celebrate the Cringe to Become the Bravest You. The book comes out next week. Listen, when it comes to your personal brand, You've likely heard the go-to advice to focus on your strengths and focus on appearing polished and focus on developing your executive presence. So embracing your awkwardness actually seems counterintuitive. It sounds like embracing a weakness. But what if awkwardness isn't really a weakness to fix? What if awkwardness can be a strength? What if awkwardness can be your greatest asset for your professional and personal growth? Well, that's exactly what Henna teaches, and we discuss her lessons to help you become a better risk taker, to help you strengthen your mental muscles, and to help you be braver in those moments when it really counts. And those lessons are all to help you excel and grow, not only in your professional career, but in your personal life too. So here it is. Here's my interview with Henna Pryor. Hi, Henna. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to see you. I'm excited to see you as well. Congrats. Congrats on your first book, Good Awkward. Thank you. It's felt it's felt like the most insane couple of years and especially an insane couple of months, but I just am so excited to have this book baby out into the world and for people to meet her because I am just so excited to to share this message out. I love the book. I love the message. I love the design in the book. I'm so yeah. grateful with some of the authors at, as of late who've actually put intentionality into the design inside the book, not just, you know, putting the words on the page, but actually having a cool design in there. No, yeah, I appreciate that. And honestly, it was a lot of intention behind that. So it means a lot that it was noticed. I'm not a particularly visual person. I think I'm more in words and text. And what I've learned, you know, over the years is that people absorb information differently. It was important to me to have pictures and models and things that if you want to absorb the message that not everyone does it the same. So I'm glad it looks good. I hope it is easy to absorb too. And also with the pictures, especially the pictures of you and your family, it gives more of that humanity into it. Like you're actually able to connect with you, the author that way. Yeah, I think that that's so much of the backbone of this whole thing, right? And there, to be very clear, Matt has an inside scoop as to what pictures these mean. These are not cute pictures of me. Like, these are not attractive photos of me, but it's a book about awkwardness. And so the pictures really do have to be reflective of the spirit of what we're trying to do here. Yeah. And with that spirit, when we think of focusing on building our personal brand, The go-to advice seems to be we should focus on our strengths. We should put our best foot forward. We should always appear polished. And we should all have that executive presence developed. Embracing awkwardness seems counterintuitive to that approach. So why would we want to do that with our personal brand? And this to me is at the heart of everything that goes into this book. Usually we hear this word awkward, awkwardness. And we do not have a positive association with that word. We're like, I don't want to be that. I don't want to feel that. I don't want to experience that. So let me first give a little bit of context to this word. People use it differently. There's really two main ways people think of it. We sometimes use the word to describe ourselves as a trait, 
right? I am awkward. I am socially awkward. It is a trait terminology. Other times for folks who would not refer to themselves that way, awkwardness can just be a state. I feel awkward right now. I just had an awkward conversation. I'm about to enter this awkward negotiation. It's more of a transient thing. And ultimately, it is a social emotion. It's an emotion we don't experience when we're completely by ourselves. So if we call someone by the wrong name at home and no one heard us, we don't tend to feel awkward. It's something that happens socially, and it is an emotion of discomfort. So to answer your question, we don't immediately think of it as a good thing or something to lean into. But when diving into the research and looking at the ways it relates to personal brand, you know, there's been this very overarching message that that polished performative version is not as likable anymore and that we need to find this authentic version. And often I hear leaders and professionals say, well, I know I need to be more authentic, but I feel like I don't know how. And this is where awkwardness becomes an interesting exploration because there's this emotion, this uncomfortable emotion that stands in the way of us accessing that authenticity. And that's where the work needs to begin. So what does that look like in, in being able to focus on that? I'll just give a real tactical example of how this played out, especially in the pandemic. So yeah. when we all got thrown into COVID world and every meeting that was once in person, or at least the ones we were having with humans in a room, got thrown into Zoom. We all remember those early days, right, where nobody really had time to curate their background. It was just whatever was behind us. Does this, does this camera even work, right? All yeah. of us were just thrown into this. And one of the interviews I did for the book was uh, a very senior leader in the telecom space. And she would describe her CEO of the company as kind of what you described at the top. Very polished, very put together, didn't really let his bumpy edges show. She said that everybody thought this guy must sleep with a suit on. He, he rarely, rarely cracks a smile. He takes himself yeah. so seriously. And then the pandemic happened like it did for all of us. And all of a sudden, this guy is leading all hands calls on Zoom and his kid is tugging at his sleeve and the dog is barking and he's swatting away people because he's trying to focus. And in that moment, all of those bumpy edges that he desperately tried to tuck away, all of those awkward moments that he tried for years to hide were on full display. And counterintuitively, rather than people thinking this guy's a mess, his approval ratings skyrocketed. People found him more likable. People found him more relatable. They enjoyed hearing from him. They wanted to spend more time with him. And because of that experience and all the, the positive things that came from it, he changed the way he led in that company. He relaxed his attire. He was less buttoned up in meetings because there were so many positive effects. And that's the value of embracing it well before you are thrown into it and have to. That's one of the one of the blessings I think that happened during the pandemic was yeah. when there was so much remote work and virtual meetings, virtual town halls, virtual presentations, people were doing that from home. And so yeah. you actually got to get a glimpse into people's personal lives. You got a glimpse into their actual humanity. They weren't some just straight, uh, polished robot. Yeah. Well, because the truth is none of us are. Right. None of us are able to sustain at that. And actually, one of my favorite pieces of research in doing the, the work for the book was there's a, some new studies that came out of Francesca Gino and her team at Harvard around performing and catering at work. So when we use this yeah. like language of this polished version of ourselves, you know, sometimes that version is authentic. We feel really put together in a moment. But often the danger becomes when that polished persona turns into catering to meet someone else's expectation, being a version of ourselves that we expect them to want or what we think they expect of us. And the data actually found that our workplace performance suffers significantly. They had an investor pitch competition that they evaluated where entrepreneurs were pitching for funding. And they actually found out that those who catered were one third less likely to get the funding versus those who came in blazingly authentic stumbles, fumbles, awkward missteps and all, they were three times more likely to get the funding. So there's actually an impact, a measurable impact on our performance when we put on that polished performative version of ourselves in a moment where it's for other people and not for us. I can't recall if the research showed this. I can't recall mm -hmm. if you pointed this out, but when we cater to people mm -hmm. like that, 
It's exhausting. It uh -huh. drains mm -hmm. us considerably. And when we're exhausted, when we're so drained uh, mentally, and then we get drained physically, our work performance does suffer from that. Yeah, there's research that supports it. And it is something that we talk about in the book, which is people will all kind of remember, you know, think about your first days of school or your first days yeah. at a new job. And there's so many other factors that go into it, but we collapse into bed those evenings. And it often, in large part, has to do with the fact that we are putting forth our best version of ourselves on those days because we are deeply concerned with impression management, which is not a be-all, end-all. We shouldn't do it, right? Impressions do right. matter, but we are so hyper-concerned with impression management, everything we say, everything we do, that it is physically exhausting. Our brains physically tire out from doing that much performative work that on days like that, we collapse into a heap. At the end of the day, we're exhausted, we're tired. And so it's not a coincidence that we do that because performing and catering actually has that physical impact on our mental health. So when we talk about awkwardness, then thinking about it this way, what we've discussed so far, it sounds like this is not just the same kind of book that talks about getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. This is a bit different, right? Yeah, this is, you know, awkwardness is an emotion of discomfort. But what I think I'm most proud of is that this isn't just about discomfort. Awkwardness is actually a very unique emotion because discomfort can happen when you make a mistake. Discomfort can happen when you fail. Discomfort can happen when you disagree with someone. There's lots of ways that you can be uncomfortable, but awkwardness actually exists in a very specific place. The definition I like to use is we feel this emotion when the person we believe ourselves to be, our true selves, is for a moment at odds. There's a gap between that person and the person who they see on display. There's a person we believe ourselves to be our true selves. And all of a sudden, there's this person over here that they see on display. Our internal yeah. identity doesn't match or meet their external reality. Yeah. So again, let's make this very simple. I raise my hand in a meeting. I offer what I think is a great suggestion. And everyone's like, no, Henna, no. Like, what are you talking about? Or we already said that. We already decided that was a bad idea. For that moment, maybe it's a moment, maybe it's for hours afterwards that I'm ruminating, but for that moment, the person I believe myself to be competent at work, intelligent, someone who has good ideas, feels at odds with the person they saw. She doesn't know what she's talking about. She doesn't have good advice to give or answers to provide. And in those moments where those two people aren't the same, we feel awkward. That's the emotion that bubbles up. And so it's learning how to stay in that middle space uniquely, not just discomfort, but that middle space that really helps us take the risks we want to take going forward. And awkwardness has that specific ability to do that as it relates to freezing us or helping us move forward. I got to think that most everybody has that tendency to, to freeze, to stay frozen in that and to say, I don't like how I felt in that moment. Therefore, next time I'm not going to raise my hand. Next time I'm not going to create a more awkward situation. And this is where the danger lies, of course, right? When we explore awkwardness as part of, you know, how do we incorporate this into our personal brand? The, the biggest danger that we're reckoning with is if we felt awkward once, if we felt awkward before in a specific situation, what is the story that we're telling ourselves about this situation? Because the biggest fear is the next time we avoid it, the next time we choose inaction because we don't want to feel that discomfort again, that difficult social emotion again, that's where the danger lies. If you are trying to position yourself as, a, you know, from a personal brand standpoint, as someone who is innovative, who takes risks, who is courageous at work, and that fear of a potential awkward situation is causing you to avoid, those two things aren't aligned. And it becomes very, very difficult for you to position yourself the way you want to be if that's the outcome. It sounds like a lot of our reaction to that awkward situation, that awkward moment, a lot of it is really happening in our own head, in our own mind. So maybe part of it is a mindset game. Is there a yeah. way to reframe our mindset, to reframe in our own head how that awkward situation actually did affect us? 
Yes, I love that you pointed that out because really embracing awkwardness is 90% mindset. So the book is kind of divided into two parts. There's the mindset element and then there's the tools, strategies, tactics element. But the mindset bit is the most important bit. And there's really two elements to me that I think are most important and impactful when it comes to reframing the mindset around awkwardness. The first is awkwardness is universal. Awkwardness is not something that the most confident people you know have figured out how to get rid of or have figured out how to avoid because I really I anchor into this truth. To avoid awkwardness means to eliminate all uncertainty in life. You can't. Yeah. You know, you can't. And so there is no way to remove awkwardness. The most confident people you know experience it just as often as you do and often as acutely as you do and as intensely as you do. Their ability to recover from that emotion and that bounce back factor is quicker and higher. And often they lean into it instead of trying to avoid it because ironically, the avoidance of awkwardness increases awkwardness. Yeah. So rather than trying to avoid it or run away from it, they name it right away. They lean into it. They move towards it. The universality of it is the one first most important piece of mindset. The second is just what types of stories are we telling ourselves about this awkwardness? So I had an awkward situation you know, sure didn't feel good. No one is saying that it did. But then what is the story we are telling ourselves afterwards? And so I love the framing that uh, D- Dan McAdams, he's a Northwestern researcher. He uses the term contamination stories versus redemptive stories. Right. Are we telling ourselves, wow, Hannah, you tried to say that thing. You got shot down. What a dummy. You know, why did you even bother raising your hand? You probably shouldn't do that next time. Or was it a, you know, I didn't like doing it. I didn't like raising my hand just then, but I tried it. Didn't work the way I hoped it would, but I tried it. And I give myself kudos for that. And hopefully next time it'll have a different outcome, but I'm going to try again. That's a redemptive story. So we really have to slow ourselves down long enough to examine what are the stories we're telling ourselves about this emotion. And if we don't do that pre-work, then none of the tactical tools and strategies are going to make much difference. So when you say pre-work, meaning helping us understand in our own head ahead of time, hey, I'm going to take this awkward situation, this awkward experience. If it doesn't go the way that I planned, here's how I need to react. And just having a deeper understanding of what the emotion actually represents. Again, I think any uncomfortable emotion, we can attach all sorts of values about what it means. If I embarrass myself at work, I can sit there and believe me, I have, go down a pity party about yeah. what kind of person that makes me or what kind of you know idiot I am. And that is natural, it's human, and it also is dangerous because anyone who has a desire to grow and learn, they are going to invite situations in the future that are going to r- in- increase the risk of awkwardness, of right. embarrassment. And so it's really starting with that fundamental understanding of what does this emotion actually represent Is it just me? Everyone seems to think awkwardness is just them. Nope, it's not. It's 100% universal. There's some interesting research about how tribes people in Papua New Guinea who had never seen themselves in a mirror ever actually saw themselves for the first time and, and cringed. Yeah. Because every human at a biological level is looking for other people to see something. And when that seems disparate or different than what they actually see, It invites that feeling. So the universality is number one. And then again, the priming your brain of if this happens, or rather in the case of awkwardness, when this happens, because uncertainty, what is the story I'm going to tell myself afterwards? And can you mentally pre-design what your reaction is going to be? So you're a little more equipped to go there in the moment when it eventually does happen. Gotcha. That makes a lot of sense. You know, I talked to different leaders about the behaviors that they want to try and instill in their employees. And one of the key things to do that is to reward the behavior, not Mm -hmm. so much the outcome. I mean, if you want your people to be creative, if you want them to be innovative, well, when they bring innovative and creative ideas, reward them for that action, reward them for the behavior simply doing that. Even if the idea wasn't that great, even if the idea wouldn't work, because that's going to help them want to do that again. So in in the same way, it sounds like, okay, you know what? That was awkward when I spoke up in the meeting, but you know what? Good job, Matt. You did it. Right. You spoke up. Right. You took an at-bat. Exactly right. And I actually, I'll an take it even a yeah. step further. I love what you said about 
rewarding the behaviors. Part of what I believe very strongly in this work is building social muscle is a muscle, right? The same yes. way with physical muscle, the same way with our you know own personal quiet mental muscle, mental fitness. Social muscle needs to be exercised. And so what I suggest to leaders and people who have teams is don't wait for the moment for the behavior to sort of arise organically. See if you can create moments at work to make the behaviors intentional. For example, I love the idea of starting a meeting with a bad idea brainstorm. I love the idea of starting a meeting with cracked egg stories, meaning things that didn't go as planned, mistakes, missteps. We need to normalize what it feels and sounds like to share less than flattering moments in a group setting. Clearly, when they happen, we can normalize the acceptance of them. But I'd like to see us go a step further, especially in a world that is optimized for smoothness anymore, to actually make these things intentional and part of our day. The same way we condition other muscles, we need to condition our social muscles proactively in order for our teams to have that muscle on the ready when it counts. I'm primarily in the customer experience realm. Yeah. And part of that is the idea, the focus of like, we want to smooth things out for our customers. We want to make things friction less for them. Yep. But when it comes to our own development, our own growth, our own growing of this you know, muscle, we actually have to inject some friction in there. We have to. I, I love that distinction. I think it's really important, right? In the CX space, there needs to be certain aspects of our experience where we are working actively to reduce friction. But the very nature of being a human being, working with other human beings in a social setting, and again, this is where the uncertainty comes in. You can optimize for smoothness and friction-free in certain parts of a customer experience journey, but I would love to see a CX person who's like, I know what every single person I'm about to encounter is feeling, thinking, and what they're about to say next, right? Like, I wish, not a chance. And in those moments, you owe it to yourself to condition that social muscle for the uncertainty, for the chance that what you say in that moment could be the entirely wrong thing, despite your best efforts. And what are you going to do then? That we have to be prepared for, and we can only be prepared through that social conditioning. And for like, like you were talking about, you know, having your at bats, getting your reps in, mm -hmm. you know, like, like that's how you grow your muscle. That's how you yeah. get stronger at it. So, yeah. so what are some of the strategies? What are some of the tools that we can incorporate to build up our muscle for awkward tolerance? Mm, I love it. Yes, there are many. One that is so old school, but I have to bring it back, especially in the context of CX is yeah. we used to role play a lot more. And people don't do it because it's awkward. Yeah, it is. It's awkward. Role playing, role playing is so awkward. And if you don't practice with each other and on your teams, you are practicing on your customers, on your stakeholders, on your most important clients. You are practicing one way or another. It's just who are you practicing on? That is a fantastic distinction. You're going to practice regardless. Mm -hmm. Do you want to practice in a safe setting? with your teammates or do you want to practice on your customers like when it really counts? Right, exactly. And Good so point. it's can we practice in small stakes moments, low stake moments? Can you afford to practice in the high stakes moments? I would argue probably not, right? So let's bring that back. Again, we've gotten away from it because it requires more intentionality than ever, especially with hybrid teams, decentralized teams. It takes a little more effort, a little more work, but yeah. we have to get back to that, especially in CX environments. I would also say that when it comes to tools and conditioning, again, I love the bad idea brainstorms. I love the cracked egg stories. I also encourage people to be a lot more intentional with their language. I think part of embracing the awkwardness is actually naming it more often. So I found some really fascinating research that when a leader or a team member actually expresses awkward discomfort in the moment that they feel it, there are so many benefits. It actually makes people come across as more trustworthy, more kind, more generous, and more forgivable, and actually helps people increase relationship satisfaction with that person. So people hear this and they're like, how, why? Because your lack of perfection puts other people at ease. Yeah. Your lack of perfection puts other people at ease. So in those moments, one of the, you know, it sounds so simple, but it's not something we do often enough. Name the thing, say the thing, express the thing. Wow, Matt, I stuck my foot in my mouth there. That was pretty awkward. Guess what? Actually naming it diffuses the tension. 
immediately would make me more likable to you, more trustworthy to you, and helps us move through it. It's when we try to run from it, it's when we try to you know, avoid it altogether, that it actually worsens. And so practicing getting the habit of naming it as you feel it is actually a very confidence building activity and makes you appear much more courageous and confident to those that you do it with. Wow. So going back to what we were talking about earlier, this traditional thinking around personal branding and executive presence yeah. is like, actually, maybe don't focus on being so polished, focus on sharing and embracing the awkward moments. And that's actually even a better thing. That's going to be a strength in, instead of a weakness. Yes. And so I want to make one distinction well, just because I think this is important. There's a, okay. a phenomenon referred to as the pratfall effect. So this is yeah, yeah, yeah. essentially the phenomenon that describes the fact that when someone makes a little mistake, so in the book, I use the example of you spill coffee on your lap. If you right now spill coffee on your lap, it actually makes me like you more. And people are like, what? Like little mistakes and blenders. But there is a caveat. And I think this is the important distinction. This works when the person in question is generally seen as capable and competent and smart. Right. So if you are generally someone who is perceived as they know what they're doing, they're smart and they've, you know, spilled coffee in their lap or they called someone the wrong name, then it actually has a positive effect. It actually makes us like you more because essentially what it does is it knocks you off the proverbial pedestal we put you on. It humanizes you, as you said earlier. Now, the, the caveat again here is if you are brand new to the job, if you have not yet demonstrated a degree of competence or aptitude in your job, then I don't want it to be a universal, please just talk about how you feel awkward all the time and feel about, you know, you're you're embarrassed constantly. There does need to be some social capital in the bank. But for the majority of us who have been in a career at least for a year or two plus that have generally demonstrated a level of competence, this is something that statistically creates more likability, more trust. Gotcha. So there has to be some form of balance in there, at least. Again, like any humanizing quality, you want to be careful that you've built up enough social capital that it's not used against you. I think it's important to add that this is also different across certain gender classes, across different racial classes. There are still studies that prove that women of color in the workplace are still disproportionately scrutinized. And what we think of as confidence is still held to a standard of almost needing to be flawlessness for certain populations. And so, again, testing for psychological safety, looking to your mentors and leaders and peers to see the levels of awkwardness or mistake sharing, misstep sharing, what is tolerated in the workplace. We still have to do that scanning and that analysis before we can go full in on blunder city, right? Just a little bit of careful analysis first. I read that research in the book as well. So I guess I want to veer off, slightly off track for just a moment. So what can we do to help, to help leaders? What can we do to help leaders recognize that there are certain groups, I think primarily BIPOC groups that have more scrutiny given to them in awkward situations? What can we do to help leaders recognize that and to be less scrutinizing? Ultimately, this is, you know, decades of systemic structures that we're going to need to dismantle slowly. But my my short answer would be twofold. A, vocal allyship. So if a woman of color has had a misstep or a blunder and it seems as though in meetings, whether in front of them or outside of them, is a, a disproportionate level of finger pointing or, you know, that shouldn't have happened. If anyone notices this, it's, it is awkward to speak up and say, hey, I think we're putting a little too much stock in XYZ for this person. You know, I think that is an awkward act of courage to be an ally for that person. But also secondarily and perhaps more accessible to the average leader is what I described before of create opportunities to share these things in a meeting, in a public forum where not just that person is singled out, but that everyone is thinking about what is a cracked egg story that I can share from this week, this month, right? When we make it commonplace, when we normalize that this is everyone's experience, not just one person's experience, it makes it feel okay. It starts to build that level of psychological safety. Too often we wait until something went sideways to have a discussion about it. Everybody's got little things, big things that went sideways at work. Create spaces to bring those up in a social context. 
it also has a secondary effect of employees are less likely to brush things under the rug, right? Brush mistakes under the rug because you're actually creating opportunities for these to come out into the conversation, into the light. It's when we keep it in the dark that people feel like, well, it's just me. And that helps build the team muscle or the organizational yeah. muscle for that too. Right. right. Again, I think optimizing for friction free is not helping us. Yeah. We just need yeah. to do it together. There are different times in our career where it seems like, okay, it makes sense to embrace the awkward in low stakes situations in our career. But what about high stakes moments like presentations to our executive leadership or job interviews? How should we approach awkward situations in those moments? I'll kind of give two frameworks on this. There's awkward situations that are unplanned. So if I'm walking into an interview and I trip over my own two feet on the way into the interview room, I didn't exactly plan for that, right? That's an right. unplanned situation. So the priority there becomes working on those stories that we tell ourselves so we can be quicker on the recovery. Oh, again, that was awkward. The, what, a, what a way to start, right? Infusing a little bit of humor. There's a whole chapter on using humor to address yeah. awkwardness. So when they're unplanned, Planned moments, have a plan. What is the story you're telling yourself immediately? How can you incorporate some humor or how can you name, hey, that was awkward to diffuse the tension quickly? Then there's also life's planned moments. I feel awkward about giving this presentation. I feel awkward about going into this interview. This is not an unplanned moment. This is just a general emotion into something that is a planned situation. And in those cases, diffusing the awkwardness in the moment is still going to call on the same strategies as unplanned. But it really boils down to preparation. Again, we talk about role play. We've also gotten away from mock interviews. Are we doing mock interviews, mock negotiations? These are all things we've gotten away from. And I'll tell you why we've gotten away from them. And I find this fascinating. People tell me, I hear top performers, leaders tell me, I don't rehearse. I don't practice because I find rehearsal makes me nervous. And to that, I tell them, that's not a thing. That's not a thing. That's a form of self-handicapping, which essentially yeah. means that we don't allow ourselves to do these things because that way, if it doesn't go well, if it's awkward, if it doesn't work, then we can blame that, right. right? We don't have to find out if we're any good because we can blame that. And so I just want people to be very mindful and careful as they enter a situation that they fear will be awkward. Are you self-handicapping? Are you avoiding the pre-work? Because then you can go ahead and blame that if it feels awkward, if it doesn't go well. So really double down for the planned situations that invite that emotion in you. Double down on the reflection work. Double down on the prep work. Double down on the rehearsal, on the social reps. That will help you feel much more empowered when you actually go into those. Throughout what we discussed, a key theme really has been planning and preparation. Don't wait to figure out how you're going to react when you're in the moment have a plan and prepare yourself by going through these reps and going through practice. Yeah, it's it's funny to me because it almost seems simple. Mm, simple brand podcast, yeah. right? It almost seems simple, but it's the value of practice with any muscle. Like we know this with physical muscle. We right. Anyone who's tried to desperately pick up a meditation practice will know that how many times they would have to practice being in that headspace before it felt remotely natural. So why do we expect situations that involve our social muscle to be different? We can't. This is just another form of muscle that requires attention. It requires repetition. It requires being activated more than in the moments that we need them. For many of us who are now working from home in isolation, we don't get to see our peers every single day. There's yeah. actually research that confirms that the social muscles can atrophy. And I always give people this one little uh, tidbit because everyone smiles and remembers their own moment. When the pandemic finally started to lift and we started to meet with our peers in person in like big conference settings or back in the office, those first few days where you're like, um, are we like, are we high-fiving? Like, what are we, are we standing near each other? Like what? And, and more than that, it's like we forgot how to read each other's social cues. Yeah. Does he think this is funny? Does he think I'm a moron? Like our, our, we forgot how to read each other's faces. And that's not coincidence. We actually lose practice using our social muscles. They can atrophy the same way our physical muscles do. So knowing this, knowing that the research points this out, 
we have to be ahead of it. And that's what the power of conditioning a social muscle can do. And looking at it that way, recognizing it as right. a muscle that can grow or atrophy, that yeah. should help us recognize the value in the planning, the preparation, and the, the practice. As a point on that, it is really funny how we love to see awkwardness in other people. We love when someone else is outwardly awkward and owns it, and we still desperately try to tuck that part of ourselves away. It's the ultimate paradox. We love it when somebody else is, you know, my opening story in the book is about Jennifer Lawrence. I often think about, you know, women like Arby Plaza or even Brene Brown, who are just so open in their stumbles and fumbles and awkwardness. So we love them. We're like, ah, it's so refreshing. Mm -hmm. And yet we don't want people to view us like that. And so that's the tension that we need to start to navigate is why are we playing by two sets of rules here? And can we give that same opportunity to ourselves? I want to veer off the books a little bit and, and away from mm -hmm. personal branding. So we're yeah. both parents. I've got two boys. They're 13 and 10. Your children are close to the same age, right? Yeah. Layla, my daughter's 13. My son Zane is 11. So almost the same age. Cool. C cool ages. Um, okay. I'm curious, how can we help our kids in learning how to embrace the awkward? Oh, man, Matt, you and I both have 13-year-olds. So this is like the world we are swimming in right now. Middle school is just awkward city. I'll share what I, you know, my, my husband and I try to prioritize at home. And, and I think that these are little seeds that we're trying to plant. So we've got some dinner questions that we do at dinner when they come home from school. They've got three questions. They know that they're coming. So my kids are prepared. The first is what was the best part of your day? The second is what was something new you learned? But the third is the awkward activation question. The third question we ask at the end of every day is, What's something that gave you butterflies today? What's something that gave yeah. you butterflies today? And yeah. so the intention of that question is twofold. It's A, butterflies are normal, right? Mm -hmm. Feeling those kind of awkward, embarrassing, I tried something, I raised my hand are normal. It's part of the day. But also by asking that question daily, or at least as close to daily as we can, what I'm also hoping to activate is priming their brains to look for those moments. To right. seek out those moments and to view them as a positive, as something that mom and dad were going to give them a round of applause for, right? So my daughter, Layla, in, in eighth grade this year, they actually have public speaking as an elective, believe it or not. School just started this week. So she had her first public speaking class yesterday. And so I asked her the question, you know, what gave you butterflies today? She's like, public speaking, mom. I had to stand up and say, hi, I'm Layla. And da, 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 da. and she's like, and I hated it. And I said, okay, did you get through? Like, I did. I said, are you still alive to tell the tale? You think you'll, you'll be better next time? She's like, It'll probably be easier next time, right? But I was like, I'm so proud of you for doing it. I know it gave you butterflies, but you did it, right? Just normalizing that those emotions are normal, but also I, I want them to look for them and know that no matter how it went, that we're going to celebrate the fact that they did it. That's it. Celebrating, praising, rewarding the behavior. Yeah. Not so much the outcome, if it went well or didn't go well, yeah. But the behavior itself. The, the research points to the fact that this self-consciousness, which awkwardness is a self-conscious emotion, it actually yeah. doesn't develop until early adolescence, eight or nine. So usually you'll see little kids, they're just they dancing don't care. naked, right? It doesn't matter at all. They don't care. It's really about age eight or nine that people start to notice those things. And I think middle school specifically, and our, our 10 and 11 year olds too, they're very hyper aware on social belonging. And again, awkwardness is a social emotion. And so I just try to remind both of my kids as often as possible that even if it's expressed differently, that if a kid is being mean or if they're piling on to what another mean kid is doing, just for them to understand that them trying to find their footing in social belonging is really their attempt to make themselves not feel awkward. We're all kind of yeah. in the emotion together and to try not to take your own emotions personally, but also understand that other kids are trying to reckon with that very same thing. That makes sense. You know, I'm curious if you ever want to have a follow-up to this book, maybe one for adolescents and teens. It's being discussed, right? Good Awkward really? for Teens is, really? is on the table a little bit. Yeah, we've been talking about it, my publisher and I, because honestly, I it's the book I needed. I think any any yeah. modicum of confidence people see in Hannah Pryor makes me laugh because it is purely a result of me leaning into exactly this. I have been awkward my whole 
life, I just stopped trying to eliminate it. Yeah. I just stopped trying to not be worried about it anymore. And that has led to every confidence, risk-taking, courage version. And I just try to have my kids feel the same way about it. Well, I can't wait for that book to come out too. <laughs> Right, Hannah, Hannah, I've got one last question for you. If you were to create a five-song playlist for Good Awkward, what songs yes. would you include? Now, I'm so sad that I could only pick five because I you can choose actually, me? yeah, I'll, I'll share in a second. But the, the five that I landed on were Brave by Sarah Bareilles, What Makes yeah. You Beautiful by One Direction, Nervous in the Alley by Less Than Jake, so it's slightly different uh, oh, yeah. genre here. Uh, effing perfect by pink that's actually the name of the song but it's the one you've heard on the radio that's yeah. edited for the radio edit of course and then there's actually a book called or a, i'm sorry a song called awkward by a, an indie pop band called san cisco that's about feeling awkward in social situations so those would be my five nice. but i loved i loved when matt asked this because i actually have a good awkward playlist so if you're on spotify look up good awkward the playlist and there's 50 songs about those moments that you're trying to feel less awkward and embrace it. So I, I love the, the music angle. Well, Hannah, I've always learned so much from you. I've, I've especially learned a lot from your book and our discussion today, but where can people go to learn more? I am Hannah Pryor on all the socials. LinkedIn is my preferred playground, but yeah. Instagram as well. And the book, um, goodawkward.com has some more information. It's available for pre-order Amazon, Target, Barnes & Noble, everywhere books are sold. And I love making new friends and you can make it real awkward. Send me a LinkedIn invite. Tell me it's awkward to do so and do it anyway, because I love making new uh, online friends. I'd love to connect. Hannah, I always love seeing you, always love spending time with you. But this one today was extra special. Thank you for being here. I love here. it. I had so much fun, Matt. Thank you for inviting me. I hope you enjoyed my discussion with Hannah Pryor. You can learn more from her by following her on LinkedIn, where she regularly shares lessons on how to excel in your career. Now, sometimes the lessons are from Henna's own personal experience, so they can get, well, a bit awkward. And if you want to dive deeper into some of the lessons we discussed today, then go visit goodawkward.com and grab your copy of Good Awkward. It comes out next week, so if you pre-order it now, you'll be sure to have it when it releases. And when you visit goodawkward.com, you'll receive an exclusive bonus chapter on networking. And that's one of the most awkward experiences there is. Now, that chapter's not even in the physical book, and you'll be the first to know about future bonus chapters that Henna releases. If you're enjoying the Simple Brand Podcast, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. It's going to make it so much simpler for you to get future episodes like the next one featuring Nancy McDonald Reuter. Nancy and I discuss lessons from her book, How Senior Marketers Scale the Heights. What's still true, more true, and newly true. If you want to learn how to grow your influence and grow in your career as a marketing leader, while also staying on top of your ever-evolving customers' needs, then this episode's for you. So go ahead and subscribe. You'll automatically get Nancy's episode as soon as it's live. Until then, keep it simple. Keep it simple.